Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Travis. Wonderful job. And thank you, Joanne. Played beautifully as always. And Mr. Frank, wherever Frank is. There he is. Good to have you all here today. Turn with me, if you would, to Job chapter 12. If you're a visitor, know that we have been talking about uh, the New City Catechism. What's the New City Catechism? It's a book that walks us through 52 basics of our faith. And so last week, or two weeks ago, we talked about the nature of the Trinity. And we talked about how the communal nature of the Trinity, three persons and one God, we worship one God, uh, draws us into this need for one another, this need for community. And last week, we looked at question number four, which was, why did God make us? What are we here for? And you have to answer that question. If you don't know what you're here for, you're never going to accomplish what you were made for. You were made to worship Christ. And to worship Christ means to obey Him and to follow His will for your life and to tell others about the love that He has poured out on this world and how He died on the cross to save men from their sins. But here in chapter 5, it says, well, what did God make the rest of all this stuff for? He made you to worship Him. He made me to worship Him. Well, what's nature for? What's the point of creation? I used the illustration last week of a referee. And we are referees in this world. We don't make our own rules. No, we follow the rules of the league office. We, we do what we are told to do. We enforce the rules that we are told to enforce. And in doing so, we bring order. I think a better illustration, though, is a coach. We are called to be coaches in this life, to tell other people, no, you're heading in the wrong direction. If you play like that, if you try and accomplish, you're going to drop the ball, you're going to run the wrong route, there's going to be all sorts of confusion, you're going to miss a block, your quarterback's going to get his head taken off, whatever the case may be. We bring order into the situations we find ourselves in because ultimately we go to the greatest coach, the one who made us, the one who designed us, and he knows what's best for our life. Well, then what then is the creation for? Well, I look at creation as the field. Creation are the nice lines and the orderliness of everything around us. Without the field, it'd be really hard to play football, right, men? If you didn't know how far 10 yards was, you're just guessing what a first down is. Well, that'd be frustrating. And if you didn't have coaches there to help you... But, you know, the field doesn't just randomly show up, does it? You don't just walk out one day and there's a football field. No, or a soccer field, or a baseball, whatever. Someone came along and put the hard work into making that happen. Somebody came along years before and planned the drainage system so that your football field or your baseball field or whatever would be playable even when it rains. Somebody came along and planted the grass. Somebody mowed the grass. Somebody came and painted all those nice straight lines, and I still don't understand how they do that, but anyway... Somebody cares for that, intends for it, so that you can play by the rules that the coaches, the league, and the refs enforce. And when we come to nature, we see the orderliness of it all. I don't know how many of you hunt, but one of my favorite things when I go hunting, it's going to sound weird, but when I don't get anything, when I don't even see anything, that's one of my best times hunting. Because it's in those moments, I'm not distracted. You know, when a big deer comes out, your heart starts racing. You're not paying attention to anything anymore. But when there's nothing out there, I'm just staring at nature. I'm just staring at the creation. I'm not distracted by the possibility of food on the table. I'm just watching the sunset. I'm watching birds fly around. It's so beautiful. Why did God give us this? You know, uh, Hatcher's going to have uh, friends giving here after church, and they went and picked up a whole bunch of barbecue. God didn't have to give us barbecue, but he's a good God, and he gave us barbecue. <laughs> Food didn't have to have any taste. Think about it. Food didn't have, the sunset did not have to be beautiful or the sunrise. They could have just been plain. God didn't have to give us pleasure in our relationships with other people. It could have just been like robots, something we have to do. But God's given us the enjoyment of this world and this life. Why? So that at all times, we would say, what a good God we serve. Everything in this creation points to God. I think I've used this illustration before. Stephen Curtis Chapman's daughter, when she was a teenager, was really struggling with self-esteem, as many teenagers do at some point in their high school career. And uh, she didn't like the way she looked. And so he wrote this song called Fingerprints of God. If you haven't heard it, it came out in the 90s. That's why you haven't heard it. But 
fingerprints of God. And he told her, you're beautiful because you bear the fingerprints of God. You are just the way you are, just the way God designed you. And when we look out in creation, when we look out in this world, we see the fingerprints of God. And so we come to question number five. What else did God create? There's the question. And the answer, God created all things by his powerful word. And all his creation was very good. Everything flourished under his loving rule. Let me pray for us. God, we come here this morning, Lord, and we praise you for this beautiful creation. God, you didn't have to give us pleasure. You didn't have to give us art. You didn't have to give us music. You didn't have to give us nature and the way it is. But God, you just blessed us in so many ways. Lord, I pray that just like when we look at a good painting, we see a good artist, Father, that when we look out at this world, we would see the ultimate creator. Father, that we would see the ultimate artist, the ultimate musician, the best athlete. Father, that when we walk out our door, we would be struck by the beauty of it all. And remember to worship you in that moment. In your name we pray. Amen. Job chapter 12, verse 7. But ask the beast. Let me give you all a second to get there. I'm rushing myself. Job chapter 12, verse 7. But ask the beast, and they will teach you. The birds of the heaven, and they will tell you. Or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you. Well, I don't know about you, but I only know one story where an animal talked. Actually, there's two of them. There's Balaam's donkey and there's Satan in the Garden of Eden. I've never had a fish declare anything to me. I've never had a beast teach me anything or the bushes of the earth. How on earth are these things supposed to proclaim anything to us? Well, look at verse 9. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? Turn with me to Psalm 19. Keep your finger in Job. We're coming right back to it. You see, these things declare God's goodness to us. They declare the orderliness of it all because in Psalm 19.1, well, he tells us that. King David tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork, which by the way was a memory verse for Good News Club for two or three weeks. And the week after we finished doing that memory verse, I looked at the group of 85 students in front of me. I said, who knows the memory verse? And this one man stood up and said, I know it. I said, you know the whole thing? And he said, I know it. And from memory, he recited Psalm 19.1 at Good News Club. That's an awesome thing because now this young man is joining in with nature and declaring the glory of God. And he's proclaiming his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. And like a strong man runs its course with joy, its rising is from the ends of the heaven, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat." You see, when we walk out our front door, we are struck by how things work. So a deer only pants, I've been told, I've never seen a deer pant, but I've been told that a deer only pants when it's severely dehydrated or when it's severely wounded. So when it's close to death, a deer... Who taught that deer to pant? No one taught that deer how to pant. Who teaches a, a, a young animal how to find nourishment from its mother's body? No one teaches that animal. They are naturally programmed to do that. Who teaches a cat how to scratch the mess out of your hand? Nobody teaches that. Who teaches a bog, the dog how to bark? A bog how to dark. Who teaches a dog how to bark? Nobody teaches. God has designed it that way. And He has put the orderliness in this world. And yet we have the audacity to say it happened by chance. We have the audacity to say that these things randomly occurred and over millions and millions of th years, these things just randomly happened. I was a biology major, right? I knew how to put the right answers on the page to get the grade I needed to get my degree. 
But I remember sitting there thinking, this is foolishness. Who in the world believes that all this goodness and all this orderliness can happen by chance? Who in the world believes that an eye can randomly mutate and form? It's ridiculous. No, when I look at creation, just like I said in my prayer, when I look at a beautiful painting, I see a good artist. When I hear a beautiful piece of music, I don't say, well, those notes just randomly fell on a page. Somebody spilled some ink on a page and it made this piece of music. No, somebody had to move it all. Somebody had to design it all. Someone had to speak these things into existence. And in Job chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, or sorry, 7 through 10, and then in Psalm 19, 1 through 7, we see that God designed all these details so you'd say, wow, somebody did this. Somebody incredible did this. Someone has ordered these things. You see, nature screams God's glory just like we should. I had someone tell me the other day, I wish everybody would be quiet so we could hear those rocks cry out. When Jesus is entering Jerusalem, tell your disciples to be quiet, the Pharisees told him. He said, if they're quiet, even the rocks will cry out. I mean, I'd like to hear that too. I'd like to hear some rocks scream. <laughs> That's not what it means. It's not literal. What it means is that when you look at nature, you see God's goodness everywhere, even in the designs of those rocks, even in the very orderliness of nature. Go back to Job chapter 12. Why do all of these things proclaim God's goodness? Why are we led to Him through nature? Look at verse 10 of Job 12. In His hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. You see, everything is held together by God. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. And I know we're hopping around a lot, but that's just the nature of the passage we're doing right now. All things are bound together in His goodness. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God who, Jesus Christ, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. So all things were created through Him and for Him. And because of this, all things are held together by Him. Jesus is the glue that holds this world together. Jesus is the force that allows you to draw breath. Jesus is the one who gives you the ability to go hunting, to go fishing, to walk. Jesus is the one who gives you the ability to enjoy that beautiful piece of music because He made that musician and gave them the knowledge and the wisdom to explain God's goodness and to put it on paper or to put it into the air with music. All things were created through Him and for Him. I had a friend, if you uh, watched any, and I don't know if anybody here did, but late night television during the 90s, or if you watched uh, Regis, it probably would have been Regis and Kathy Lee. Uh, I had a friend, Dan Breeding. He was Dan the Animal Man back in the 90s. And he was on David Letterman. He was on Jay Leno. He was on Kathy, uh, Regis and Kathy Lee. He was on all the big shows. He got blacklisted because it came out that he was a creationist. He came out and talked against evolution. They stopped inviting him on the shows. But I had the pleasure of teaching his kids karate and going to church with him in, Ro in Wake Forest. Well, when I got my first church, I, of course, we needed something to close out VBS. And I said, what would really grab kids' attention? Well, a seven-foot alligator would really grab their attention. So I reached out to Dan. I said, I want you to come out and do a presentation. He said, how much time do I have? Man, you got wild animals, as much time as you want. These kids are going to be locked in. And so he brought in an alligator, and he brought in a monkey, and he brought in uh, some, a big bird of some sort. Anyway, I don't even remember everything. But one of the things he brought in was a really big owl. And he asked the kids, he said, what are owls known for? And they all said, one of the kids said, they're wise. And he said, right, that's what owls are known for. You know this owl isn't wise. This owl can't make decisions. This owl does what it was designed to do. But in mankind, he's given us something different. 
within mankind, he's given us the ability to look at nature. And we can either say God did that or we can say it happened randomly. Wisdom is saying that God did this. Wisdom is saying that God holds all these things together and that God is moving in this world and that God has a plan for everything we do. Turn with me and we'll close in a passage from John chapter 3. John 3.16 For God so loved the world. All of nature was affected by the fall. In Genesis chapter 3, it talks about God coming down to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. You see, God designed them to know Him personally. He designed this nature to where they could serve Him and grow closer to Him and in obedience learn to love Him more as they fulfilled what they were made for, which was bringing order, being that coach, being that referee to the world around them. And in in Genesis chapter 3, it says that God comes down to walk with them and Adam and Eve are hiding. Why are they hiding? Because they brought that pepper to the world. (laughs) They brought that sin. They brought destruction. They brought death. They'd taken this beautiful creation God had made and they ripped it apart. C.S. Lewis has a science fiction series. Uh, if you've read C.S. Lewis, he's very famous for the Chronicles of Narnia and, and um, uh, Mere Christianity. It was his uh, greatest piece on Christianity. But he's got a science fiction series called Paralandra. And in it, he describes Satan entering the world. Everything's perfect. Everything's beautiful. Everything is as it should be. Everything's gorgeous. There's no sin. There's no death. There's no pollution. And he describes this man coming into the creation and there's a dead animal in front of him. I just want you to think about what that would do to you. You walk into this paradise and all of a sudden there's death in front of you. That's what Satan brought when he convinced Adam and Eve to sin. There's death. It's this You're listening to this beautiful symphony and all of a sudden all the horns hit the wrong note and it's just ruined. We ruined it. We destroyed not only our lives, but we destroyed the lives of our animals. We destroyed the lives of this world. We destroyed nature and now there's death and there's pollution where that was never meant to exist. In John chapter 3, he says, For God so loved the world, verse 16. That's me and you, but it's all of creation. It's everything God made. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Jesus Christ came into this world and said, your life's broken, your life's messed up. When your dog dies, when your cat dies, when your parrot dies, whatever. When you see an animal suffering. When you see a dead tree. When you see brokenness in nature, oil spills, whatever. You see the hurt in this world. You see, we did that. But Jesus Christ said, I came to save you, but not only you, but this whole world. And in the book of Revelation, we see Him remake all these beautiful things. And Revelation, the new Jerusalem, this place that we will dwell with God, comes down and we spend an eternity with Him on this earth. I, don't, I can't imagine what a, a, a perfect nature is going to look like. I can't imagine what a perfect body is going to look like and a perfect mind is going to be like. But I really can't imagine what a perfect nature is. Can you imagine a sunset even more beautiful than the ones you've experienced in your life? Can you imagine a world where animals don't get sick? Where your pets don't die? Can you imagine a world where everything you put your hand to works out perfectly and you're never frustrated? Deer, don't come and eat your garden, James Earl. That's, that'd be nice. This is what's awaiting us. You see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He's not just saving you. He's saving all of creation which we ruined through our sin. 
And now the question is, have you asked Jesus Christ to save you? You see, nature is going to be remade whether nature likes it or not. But you have a choice. Jesus Christ has built within us His image. He's given us the ability to choose life or to choose death. He's given you the opportunity. Do you want to remain with that brokenness and that sin which Hatcher illustrated? Or do you want me to clean your life up? All you have to do is ask me for forgiveness and I'll do it. All you have to do is come to me and I'll rescue you. All who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. In this beautiful nature which you already see my goodness in, you'll see things 10,000 times better for all of eternity. I worship Christ for a few decades. When I see Him face to face, I'll be with Him for trillions of years. I can't wait to see that. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you asked Him for forgiveness? If not, I'm going to come down. Travis is going to come on forward and lead us in a closing hymn. If you don't know what it means to ask Jesus for forgiveness, maybe you don't understand the Gospel. You don't understand why Jesus had to die to take your punishment. Come and talk to me. If you're interested in baptism or joining the church, I'm here. Don't leave here with questions. Don't leave here confused about how much Jesus Christ loves you. And as we go out... I want you to prayerfully consider what God would have you give to the Lottie Moon offering. 100% of that goes to tell somebody about Jesus Christ in a foreign land. 4.5 billion people in this world do not have a gospel witness. Four and a half billion people have no ready access to this message of salvation. Pray and ask God what He'd have you give. And if you need to pray with me, come on down.